Hello, I am broadcasting live here from my office at Davidson College. Hopefully, you can hear me okay. What I'm going to do is uh, offer a live playing of a work of interactive fiction, one that I often teach in my classes. I should say, though, right at the beginning, that uh, it is a very um, risky game. It makes people uncomfortable. And there are trigger warnings attached to this game. Um, there are uh, issues of abuse that come up. And if what you see me playing, uh, you know, it's all words on the screen, but nonetheless, it can make you feel uncomfortable. Uh, if it makes you feel uncomfortable um, watching it, it'll probably make you feel even more uncomfortable if you uh, play the game. But I also think the game pushes uh, the limits of what people can do with interactive fiction and make uh, a, a game have a kind of visceral impact and explore pretty deep questions in a way that most people don't associate with video games. So I can, um, I can share my screen, which is what I'm going to do. So screen share, share the game. And here's the big reveal. The game is called The Baron, and it's by Victor Getzbers. It came out in 2006, and it runs, uh, it was coded in Inform, a language designed to produce interactive fiction works, like, like uh, what we see here. And you can play it in your browser, which is what I am doing right here. And if you go to the, uh, the edX platform, under the, the event listing, you'll find the link that I just added here. So I've never really live played through a work of interactive fiction before. I usually just uh, play myself, you know, silently, uh, but we'll see what happens here as I kind of walk through the game. It's gonna be a lot of reading for me and I'll have to stop, I think, to get some water. Uh, let me do that right now while you take a glance of what's on the screen. Let me see, actually, uh, can I make my text bigger? Yeah, I can do that. That might help you a little bit. Okay, so the game opens up, and just like uh, every other uh, interactive fiction game with this interface, the top here, uh, where it says the cave's vestibule, that tells you what room you're in in the game. And, and then there's the, this opening description. The bronze doors fall closed behind you, and you hear bolts being drawn across the door. There is no way back. It is you or the dragon. Gripping the axe in a gauntleted hand, you step forward into the heat. So the game really starts, uh, it sounds like this kind of heroic quest. You have a dragon. Uh, what do you do when you have dragons and you have an axe? I think you slay the dragon, right? So we're in the cave's vestibule. Uh, this is a small rectangular hall chiseled from the rock by humans and covered with black marble. Two bronze doors to the south hermetically close off the exit. In the north, a narrow cave leads to the fiery lair of the dragon. The floor is littered with blackened bones and skulls, throwing flickering shadows southward. So I see from the description, two bronze doors to the south. Uh, I can't go that way. So the north is where I want to go. So I'm going to type. I don't even have to type go north or in fact, I don't even have to type north. I can backspace and just hit in for north. Try to step around the human bones, but with each step, several are crushed under the weight of you and your armor. And now I'm in a low passage. The cave is low and you have to stoop to walk through. The floor is covered by a thick layer of ashes. The flames that erupt from the many cracks in the ground the large hall to the north have almost blinding intensity and the heat, if nigh endurable. You are sweating heavily. In the south lies the relative coolness of the vestibule. I really have no choice but to go north here. Um, if I try to go south, if I try to escape this, I'm back in the vestibule, but, but there's nowhere else to go. So I have to go north again. And every time I move, I crush bones. I remember that image, crushing human bones. So I'm going to go north one more time. 
and I'm now in an underground hall. The hall is dozens of meters high and hundreds of meters wide and deep. The floor is covered with a thick layer of ash, except where cracks and fissures cleave the rock. Huge flames shoot upwards out of these cracks. The heat is almost unbearable. In the middle of the hall is the dragon, an enormous red scaly monster. It turns its head towards you and stares at you with two big yellow eyes. Uh, so uh, before I do my next move here, I just want to call your attention to a few things. Notice how uh, the, the words like in unendurable, unbearable come into play here. I think that's going to be important later on. Also, uh, words like ash and bone. This is really astonishing writing. It's pretty vivid writing. Uh, and we also, I, I didn't mention this, this game was originally in Dutch, so we're playing the English translation of the game, and, and for the most part, I think the translation is awfully nice. Um, so what am I going to do? I'm going to try and hit the dragon. And it assumes that I want to hit the dragon with the axe, uh, which is good. So with the axe raised, I step towards the dragon, determined to kill it. The teeth as long as the upper arm form two rows behind each other in the depths of the dragon's throat. Fire seems to be burning uh, so fast and suddenly that you do not have the time to duck away. The fire bursts out from the mouth of the dragon. Dozens of meters long that envelop you from head to toe. The pain makes you gasp. Boy, this, this, is, this is dark. I'm going to try again. Kill the dragon. Fight off the pain and charge again, even if you have to pay for it with your life. The monster must die. Through the flames, you see the two big yellow eyes. You raise your axe to plant it right between them. But suddenly the, tails, the dragon's tail hits you from your left with such force that you fly meters through the hall before your head hits a wall. The helmet softens a blow and you do not lose consciousness. When you open your eyes, you see the head of the dragon approaching, its mouth wide open, about ready to breathe deadly fire at you. After a short scream, you can no longer hear yourself. The darkness falls over you like a cool blanket. Th this sounds like the end, doesn't it? Like this wasn't much of a game. Uh, but let's see what happens when I press my key. Whoa. The Baron, an interactive story by Victor Gespers. Well, what happened there? Whoa. Lines from an opera. Who lacerates my soul? Who tortures my body? What torment? Oh me, what agony, what a hell, what a terror. And these are lines from Don Giovanni. So think about that. This is a video game where I start off trying to kill a dragon, a pretty classic quest narrative, you, you know, Lord of the Rings, the Hobbit type of quest. And suddenly we're in the realm of high culture here, opera, quoting opera. Let's see what happens next. A penetrating, dissonant sound twice breaks the silence of the night, waking you from restless sleep. After the second note, the church bell falls silent, and the stillness of the winter night settles over the village once again. You rub the sleep from your eyes. Very carefully, because you do not wish to wake your wife Hilda, you step out of the bed. She would certainly try to stop you. Whoa, so looks like the dragon was just a dream. We're waking up here. And now we're in our bedroom. The weak light of the moon which enters the room through the window envelops the furniture of the bedroom in a cloak of unworldly beauty. Only the soft breathing of your wife in the large bread breaches bed, breaches the silence. The door next to the heavy oaken wardrobe leads to the landing to the north. It is ice cold in the unheated room. On the chair are your work clothes, and you can see a pine night table here. So one of the neat things about interactive fiction is um, think about those, those rules of notice. Um, they really come into play in an interactive fiction. The best interactive fiction does a good job of telling you what you need to notice, sometimes by repetition, other times by actually separating words out in, a, in a separate paragraphs. So here, you know, the work clothes are worth noticing, the pine tables worth noticing. 
And anytime you see text that's uh, bracketed apart like this in a separate paragraph, a good technique is to examine it. So we just type examine clothes. These are the clothes I go to wear when I fell trees in the woods. So it sounds like I'm a lumberjack. Uh, we can also look at the night table, and you don't have to type examine every time. You can just type X, X clothes. No, oh, no, X table. A simple night table made of pine wood. The first piece of furniture you ever made on the night table is a family photo. So here's something interesting. I didn't see the family photo at first, or at least the game didn't call my attention to it now. But now that I examined the table, uh, the family photo is there, and I can start to look at that. This photograph, made for the 10th anniversary of your marriage, is a few years old. Solemnly, you stand next to each other like two black and white statues, once again clad in your wedding clothes. In the foreground, close against you, stands your daughter, Marta, little Marta, in her beautiful white dress, a radiant smile on her face. In the picture, you have laid a protective arm across her shoulder, but now she has been kidnapped by the evil Baron. Once again, you vow to do everything possible to free her. Okay, so now it sounds like we, we have the conflict. We know what the game is about. Uh, this character has a daughter who's been kidnapped by the evil Baron. Um, one thing I like to do after some text that's scrolled off the page, I can always just type L for look, and that'll kind of refresh my screen with what I'm looking at um, to see if there's anything else I want to take notice of. And actually, I, I want to look at my wife. So I'll examine wife. Lean forward to better see Hilda's face. For just a minute, she seems to go rigid and her breathing falters before resuming its steady rhythm. But you know enough. She's awake. She knows where you're going, but pretends to be asleep. A quiet approval she'd never be able to express in words, or is she simply too afraid to confront you? So this is something worth paying attention to. Uh, you might not notice it the first time you play the game, but uh, this is, this is uh, maybe the fifth time that I played through the game. So, you know, I noticed a lot, a lot of more deta details. And this, this silence on her part, pretending to be asleep, either because she is consenting to me going out to whatever I'm doing, or she's too afraid to stop me. And, uh, I mean, it looks like what I'm going to do is um, go get that baron. So let me get dressed. Um, Rest, does that work? No. Um, wear clothes. Okay, I put on my work clothes. Great, I'm dressed now. Uh, something else I saw in the room was there's the wardrobe. I'm going to examine that. We'll get more details here. It's a piece of furniture that I made from a tree sandpapered, I built it, I varnished, I made the subtle carvings, the memories of those first happy months of your marriage when you and Hilda furnished your small house make you smile. The two of you had little money, but more than made up for that with lots of enthusiasm. I'm going to open the wardrobe too. Lots of dresses, clothes. Let me just examine them. Here I examine the clothes and then I see Hilda's bridal gown as if it doesn't want to be seen with the other clothes. That's a really interesting image. Um, well, let me look again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start to go where I need to go. The door next to the heavy oaken, land, oaken wardrobe leads to the north. So that's where I'm going to go, north. And I'm on the landing. Enveloped by an uneven darkness, moonlight enters through the front door. A red door to the north leads to the room of your daughter. Uh, there's a cupboard there, and there's a mirror there. Um, let me just explore a little bit more. The 
cupboard, it quite, doesn't quite fit. Interesting. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm checking. I see we have a few viewers who have joined us. So I'm just checking to see if, I don't think I have it set up so that you can chat. Um, let's see. Well, I'll just keep con continue playing the game here. So the cupboard I examined. I'm also going to look at the mirror. Oh, I look uh, look heroic, Heroes, hero, heroism, heroism shining in my eyes. My macho lumberjack outfit fits like a glove. You think of the fear the Baron will feel when you enter his castle to pound him into a pulp. So here, here we here we definitely know what the goal is. Uh, but I did notice that my daughter's room is to the north with this uh, red door. Um, let's let's go into that room. I, I, actually, let me. I've never done this before. Let me examine the red door. I don't know if there's anything interesting in it. Oh, painted a cheerful red leads to the room of my kidnapped daughter. So I'll go north into this room. Uh, without her, the room seems dead and empty. There's a bed in which nobody sleeps, a dollhouse, a desk. So anytime there's a list of objects like this, bed, dollhouse, desk, that's um, that gives us a clue that it's something to pay attention to. So we can you know, uh, look at the bed more closely. It's a bed that I built out of my own hands. It's neatly made, the pillow puffed up, too virginal, too untouched, as if it were never meant to be used by humans. Um, there's a desk. And the desk is covered with paper, notebooks, crayons. I can look at the paper. Oops. Dozens of drawings chaotically cover the rest of the tail top, tabletop. Let me see if I can get any more information about them. So the way interactive fiction works is like you, you see something, you zoom on it, in on it, and then you see another detail, and then you zoom in on that. That's kind of what I'm doing here. So I was able to look at the drawings now. All the drawings she made are getting happy. Butterflies flap about, small house in front of a, with a family. Bright colors burst from the white paper, even in the pale light of the stars. Okay, so that's what the draw drawings look like. Uh, there was also a diary here. Let's see what that is. It's locked, fake red leather. I will not damage her diary. So I, I could type open diary. Oh, it's locked. Um, listen, as I play this game, I'm not actually going to do everything that I know you can do after having played this game many times. But but I will tell you, I'm not going to do it now, but there is a way to open the diary. Um, and whether you open it or not actually um, contributes to some of the, the kind of powerful message of the game. But let me look again here. I think I'll, I'll leave the room now. Um, there's a teddy bear there too that's that's worth exploring if you if you want to see it. But I'll I'll go back south. I'm on the landing. I feel like I really need to get down and, and start finding um, where the Baron is. So I can go down the steps. Darkness, I grab my winter coat and put it on, open up the front door and step outside into the garden. So here I'm in the garden. As I skim the, uh, the passageway, I see the road goes east to the village. From his unreachable heights, the moon looks reproachfully down on you. That's a really interesting image. Why is the moon reproaching me? Um, the tip of the church tower is interesting too. Let me see something. Examine church. Top of the church tower just peaks above the houses on the other side of the street, like a black finger against the star-filled sky. Really another interesting image, a dark, dark image. Uh, there's a letterbox. Uh, why don't I open that? Open mailbox. Um, oh, there's a letter. I'll read the letter. A letter from the Baron. So this is the Baron. 
Baron's saying that she is safe. Don't do not worry. She is safe here and is well taken care of. Do not try to visit her or take her away. My castle is heavily guarded. So th this is really um, the Baron's trying to keep her safe. It sounds like. So uh, I am angry about that. Trembling with anger, you stare at the signature at the bottom of the page. Let me examine signature. Oh, it just it replays the whole message. Okay, that's good enough. Let's uh, look again to see where I need to go. Um, the road to the east winds through the village and the forest. So I think I need to go to the east. Step into the village. And I become angry at all my neighbors and fellow vi villagers. Where are they when you needed them? There's not a single one among them with the guts to free her. So um, nobody does anything. Nobody feels responsible. That sounds like the whole village is responsible in some ways or accountable for what, what is going on. But I'm going to go forward, walking through the woods. It is like walking through the dark jaws of a gigantic and evil beast to follow the path under the overhanging foliage. This, this is just a really dark material here. So I'm walking through the forest. I... I hear the howls of a pack of wolves rise from nearby. The wolves are hungry, bold, and dangerous even to men. That's, that's ominous. I'm going to keep walking, though. So I walked eastward to the Baron's castle. From the trees to the left, a dark shape suddenly jumps out forward. It is a she-wolf. She stops a stone's throw away from you in the middle of the path, fixating you with two eyes that mirror the moon. From her throat comes a fierce growl. So if you remember the moon, the moon is looking down at us reproachfully. It seems like the she-wolf is like, too. So I don't know what to do. Um, from her throat comes a fierce growl. I do have an ax. Do I, do I, do I try and, and fight her? I'm not sure if she poses a threat right now. Let me... Um, let me try to pet the wolf. Who knows what this will do? Oh. Come here, little wolf. Come, sweet. Yes, come, sweet wolf. And amazingly, uh, the she-wolf approaches, uncertain about your intentions. She smells your hand and licks it. You lower yourself to your knees, vulnerable, and softly stroke the she-wolf's head. She comes yet nearer and licks your face. Then you embrace her, putting your arms around her neck, laughing. Whoa, I can, uh, I have a choice here. I can calm the she-wolf or break her neck. Well, those are uh, two extremes. Um, I'm going to calm her. Um, if you're playing this game, I definitely encourage you to try other things. Uh, you wouldn't have to pet the wolf when you first see her either. You could try other things as well. But I'm going to calm her completely. All right, relax, I say. Neither of us wants to fight. So long minutes of the two of us sitting, you embrace her and she lets her head rest on your shoulder. It's a kind of peaceful, sublime moment. You let go of the she-wolf and arise. I'm sorry, but I can't do anything for you. I have to go. I have to save my daughter. And the wolf regards me with understanding in her eyes. Then she calmly walks back into the forest where a lean young wolf joins her. Together they leave in search of another prey that can save their lives. That's, that's a really interesting moment. Um, I guess I could save their lives because uh, I, I could have fed them with, with my body. Uh, but there's um, kind of a theme of salvation here. I have to save my daughter, save their lives. Uh, well, let's go forward. Going east, more closer to the castle. The silhouette with the three leaning towers is outlined against the starry sky. Um, pardon me. I just got something beeped. That's okay. I'll keep playing. On the path in the forest, 
so close to the Baron. I'm going to keep going for the castle's gate. Castle's drawbridge has been lowered. 20 meters of wooden boards that allow you to cross the deep moat to the north. On the other side, a massive gate guards the entrance to the keep, but the doors are wide open. From where you are standing, the three towers appear to reach to the heavens, and the hordes of gargoyles that people the walls stare down at you disapprovingly. Again, there's that, 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 that tone. Things keep looking at me. I'm off here to save my daughter, and the moon disregards me. The wolves look down at me. The gargoyles even look at me disapprovingly. And the sound of flapping wings makes you look up where the battlements, towers, and monstrous gargoyles of the castle are outlined. And one of the gargoyles has spread his wings and with slow flaps sails down to the drawbridge. He lands a stone demon as big as a man. Two ink black eyes stare at you intently. This, this is intense. This is, this is uh, you know, we started with a dragon and we woke up and it felt like we left that realm of fantasy. But now with the wolves and the gargoyle, we've, we've really come into this, I'm not going to say magical realism, um, but, but this kind of fantastical world here. And so the gargoyle asks me a question. Fear and tension are bad counselors. With serenity, wisdom returns. But if you always call me your emotions, will you still be able to act when you have to? That's a really deep question, existential question. I'm going to say yes, only in distant rational contemplation can we carefully weigh the pros and cons and make the right decision. He who allows himself to be led by his passions will reap nothing but sorrow. So I'll select that option. And the gargoyle nods and then asks me something else. Again, you come here to fail once more. Do you still believe that it will once end differently? Whoa, I mean, it sounds like I've been here before. I'm going to let the gargoyle know that um, he's mistaken. This is the first time I've come here, number one. So you are forgotten again, the gargoyle says in this unearthly bass. I'm sorry, bass. You come here every night. I speak to you every night. Every night you lose the fight. And the next night, you once again stand before me filled with naive courage. If you keep closing your eyes to your own deeds, you will never overcome yourself. This is really, really surreal. How, how have I done this every night? Um, I, I'm going to stick with, with my firm belief that this is my first time here. If you're playing the game, you can definitely try other options. As you wish. With a cracking sound, the stone master monster respectfully bows its head. I don't think you will succeed, but who knows? Life has many surprises. Don't let me detain you unless, unless I'm at, allowed to ask you a question about my own problem. Uh, you know what? I, uh, I don't have time for you and your unlife vile creature. My daughter is waiting for me. So I'm going to dismiss the, the gargoyle who who seems to be a kind of helper character, but I'm going to just uh, go past him. And he turns around and he disappears. And I believe I can keep going east. Oh, the, the castle lies to the north now. So I'll go north. I'm in the castle's hall. Beside a facade of intactness, a true ruin hides itself. Keep that, keep that image in mind. A true ruin hides itself be behind a facade. That is, um, that, that allegory uh, applies more to just the castle in this game. So the castle's ruined. It's in sad shape. A few walls of the building to the west stand erect, the northeast. Uh, there's a path. Now you can explore this, this castle area. Um, there's, there's a kind of hidden room that you can find that uh, adds more layers to the story. But I think in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to try and find the Baron uh, wherever he is. Which way would I go? 
try east. The dining hall. This is less ruined than other parts of the castle. There's a torch. There's a torn page in the dining room table. I'm going to look at that page. A sheet of paper crumpled and torn on which sentences written in black ink. It happened again tonight. Will it never end? Will I never more be free and happy? And even if it ends, can I get rid of the fear and the nightmares? I trust, no, I hate him. I hate myself. I hate my life. All my joy turns to ashes in the fire of his lust. So this is written in the handwriting of a girl. Uh, perhaps it's my daughter. And that really makes sense here. Um, where can I go? Can I go up? No. I guess there's nothing else to see here, so I'm going to go back to the nest. That's hall. I think I go to the north. Let's see, the northwest. In the courtyard. Smaller towers have collapsed. There's the ruin to the south. Okay, I'm going to go to the north to the large tower. The bottom of this large tower. Several stacks have toppled over. Two pairs of muddy footsteps, one of an adult wearing boots, the other of a child in bare feet, lead from the door to the south all the way to the stairs. So now I feel like I'm really on the on the tail of the Baron with my daughter. So I'll go up. Oh, there he is. In the Baron's chamber. The room is sparsely furnished and dark, illuminated only by the candles of a single chandelier. In the middle of the room lies a bearskin, stuffed heads of wolves, other animals. On the northern side of the castle are two large bronze doors, and on the throne is the Baron. Okay, this is it. Kill a Baron. The Baron raises his arm when you run towards him. Why resort to violence so soon, good man, he asked. I think it would be more sensible if we talk first. Talk to Baron? Do I really want to do this? Oh, it's a conversation. You have to understand, the Baron says, that I have only acted for the most noble of no motives. My only wish to make your daughter happy. Oh. I'm going to continue with... um kind of the same attitude I had with the gargoyle, which was to, to really just get down to business. Uh, I'm impatient. Uh, I don't have much sympathy at this point. Uh, when you play this game, or if you play the game more than once, you can, you can try these other options, but I'm going to be enraged. Happy, even your beastly brain cannot be so perverted that you believe these lines, I say. And the Baron writes back, or talks back, all right, all right. Perhaps her happiness was not the reason I kidnapped her, but never, nevertheless, could I help it? Could I have acted otherwise? Are you justified in being so angry with me? This is it. Okay, I'm going to kill him. Three, kill the Baron before I can convince you of anything. So what happens? My hands grab his throat and I squeeze. His face turns red, then blue, and finally white as milk. When he's about to lose consciousness, you break his neck with a sudden wrench. Oh, that is gruesome. Like nothing he has always been. Whoa, like the nothing he has always been, the Baron implodes, becomes smaller and smaller, and then disappears entirely. All that remains is his crown. Whoa, that that is not quite what we expected, is it? The Baron disappeared. All that's there is his crown. Let me examine a crown. All metal forms, a single round ring, without gems, without engravings, only a simple band that goes around and around eternally. Uh, there's, there's a theme that's coming up here uh, about repetition, about things happening, cycles that keep repeating themselves. And here, the crown, the crown itself goes round and round eternally. So I know um, 
there's these bronze doors that I want to get to, to the, because I, we assume that my daughter is on the other side of those doors. She hints them, but they don't budge. The burning man, which has been engraved on the door, seems to grin. Let me examine that. Even figure's expression speaks of craven and desire. It is as if the flames drive him towards the object of his lust, which is undoubtedly behind these doors. On the figure's head rests a round crown. So th this is interesting. The, the, the image of flames reminds me back again about the dragon. Um, on the figure's head rests a round crown. You know what? I'm going to put on the crown. Um, crown is heavily and presses painfully to your mind, presses painfully on your mind. That's interesting. It doesn't say the crown presses painfully on my skull or my skin or my scalp, but on my mind, there's a the, the really interesting image here. But uh, I know from playing the games many times that now that I'm wearing the crown, I can actually open the door. So as soon as you walk towards the doors, they start swinging open away from you. Behind them lies nothing but darkness. You walk onwards, and when you cross the threshold, the left door falls, crashes down, emitting the sound of a huge copper gong. Immediately afterward, the right door falls down. Lots of sounds. You take another step and are standing. What? On the landing. The landing is enveloped by an uneven darkness. A red door to the north leads to the room of your daughters. I am back to where I started. What was all that about the wolves and the gargoyles and killing the Baron? Was that all a, all a dream? What is going on here? Um, there's a mirror. Let me look in the mirror again. Oh, the face of the bear and stares at you from the mirror. Mirror. So, so what, what is going on here? I am the Baron. What does that mean? What are the implications? And this is where I really need to give you another trigger warning. This is where the pieces start to fall into place. This game is not like. Uh, some interactive fiction, the, the games that, that I talked about, like Zork or Colossal Cave, which focus on spatial exploration. This is a game that focuses on internal psychological exploration. And in this case, it's kind of exploring the psyche of this person, this person who apparently is the Baron, but wants to save his daughter from the Baron. That is really spooky. Um, remember at the beginning of the game, we looked at the red door that leads north to the room, and it was described as a cheerful red. Um, I, I have an inkling that that has changed. Let me look at the door again. Examine the red door. Painted in too bright a red. That's a different description. Too bright a red leads to the room of your kidnapped daughter. So I'm going to go north there. And the room is there. The dollhouse untouched for years. The bed and the desk are nothing but useful objects. But from the bed, my daughter watches me without emotion. You can see the teddy here. So I don't know. I don't you know, know how explicitly to put the puzzle pieces together, but What's been going on is the father has been abusing his daughter and somehow has created this psychological drama of the Baron as like a, an escape mechanism, um, uh, something to help him cope with this, to distance himself from the evil, absolutely inhumane. Um, things that are going on in this house. So let me look at daughter.
She lies in her bed, wrapped tightly in her blanket like every night. Her apathetic eyes, which seem to indicate that she has turned off all her feelings, hurt you more than her despair would have. She looks like this every night. Well, this is, this is where the game is just so dark. This has been going on every night. Every night. This is what the gargoyle was talking about. This is what the Baron is talking about. The Baron, the, the Baron was trying to save her uh, from me, from the player. And this is where the game just is really powerful. It's been using the second person pronoun you through the whole game. And it really makes the player complicit in what's been going on. Um, not exactly sure, you know, what, what to do. Um, just to give you an idea that, uh, that how things have kind of changed, um, remember there were drawings on her desk? Um, sheets and papers. I'm going to look at the drawings again. Examine paper. All caps went on. Drawings. Examine drawings. I remember the drawings, how they how they had been when I first looked at them. Happy and sunshine and bright. Here, the truth is revealed. The drawings are chaotic, dark, and full of pain. Mostly faces and contorted expressions, but also monsters, graves, a small girl in a red dress, all alone in a world of dark mouths that wish to swallow her. The bright red splashes from the paper, even in the weak light of the stairs, stars. So all those images, all, all the things that we've seen throughout the game, they all come together now. Remember how my wife, um, she either was kind of silently giving her approval to go off and fight the Baron, or she was too afraid to stop me. Suddenly that, her, her inaction becomes even darker. She apparently knew what was going on, but did not try to stop us, stop me. The villagers who did nothing, remember they did nothing to prevent the Baron from kidnapping my daughter. They were complicit. Remember how the church tower, there's one line how the church, um, church tower points up silently. Even the church is silent, like all... The whole world is silent to this pain, this this painful crime that is going on. Even even the character uh, himself has kind of hidden it in the psychodrama of the of the the dragon and the baron. So the real question is, how do we get out of this? How do we stop this? There's a cycle, as the gargoyle has pointed out. Um, I'm going to leave the room. I, I'm going to say I've stopped. To lead down next to her and become one with her. This is just awful. This is like the creepiest thing ever. And I've been this person. I've been playing this person. I've, I thought he was heroic. And he turns out to be an animal. I am stronger. Um, has the circle of lust been broken? Well, you know, it's interesting. There are other options here. Even earlier, when I when I walked to the landing, I could decide to just um, go back and get something. So the path I'm taking now is not the only ending. There are multiple endings to this game. But I I feel so icky that I just want to end it as, as quickly as possible. So has this circle of lust been broken forever? Yes. This was the last night I had to undertake this journey. Will my daughter ever be able to forgive me for what I have done? I, I, you know, honestly, um, I think it has to be one. She will, she will always hate me. I've ruined her life forever. The um, number two, where, where she'll feel a tiny amount of pity, that that it just seems uh, too hopeful. So one, uh, she will always hate me. Will your other family be normal and happy again? I tell you, this is this game is harrowing. It's a harrowing game, and the, and if you play it 
several times through, you see there, there are many more layers than what we've seen. There are kind of more details to explore than what we've seen in, in, in this playthrough. But it has like an exit interview, almost debriefing me, I think, because it's been so, so harrowing. So will my family ever be happy and normal again? Honestly, I had to answer, um, definitely not one, I'll say two. It'll be outside of our family. No, no, I'm gonna disappear forever. Number three, perhaps without me, this night I will disappear from her life forever. And that's it. That's the game. Curtains fall. So this is my walkthrough of The Baron. Um, again, it's a very powerful game. It's a game I would not recommend uh, people um, under the age of, I, I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't let my children play this game, that's for sure. Uh, when I play it with my college students, they often find it disturbing. And there's that moment when they realize that they're the Baron. When, when a lot of times they're, they're, they just feel like they've been punched in the gut. And so um, I think this makes it a very powerful game. Uh, and I don't think it's necessarily, it's not trying to be a shocker game, uh, but it's trying to really explore questions of guilt and responsibility and uh, just kind of um, also, in a way, how we play games. It's really pushing the limits of, of what games can do. A lot of times, um, the, the kind of threshold for whether a video game is a powerful video game is if it can make someone cry. A lot of times I, I hear people say that, you know, if the video can make you cry, then it must have been a really powerful game. But why is crying like the, the hallmark of kind of the emotional power of a video game? This game makes me feel sick to my stomach. I think, I think that's a, a more visceral reaction than, than crying and certainly uh, not a sentimental reaction at all. So we have some other uh, kind of complicated interactive fishing games on the list to play. If you, um, if you played interactive fishing games yourself and you've come across games that are similarly trying to uh, do something ambitious narratively or emotionally or to explore some themes that we don't often associate with video games, you know, uh, share those games with us in the forum. It's always great to hear about new games that really are challenging our expectations of what uh, digital media can do. And now uh, with that I thought, I'm going to wrap it up for the night. Um, let me go back. I think I'll stop sharing my screen. So you can see me as I say good night. Uh, thank you for watching, whether you watch this live or watch it later. Um, I hope that you play through the Baron yourself, if, if it's not too freaky for you, and explore more of the nuances of the game. All right, thanks a lot. Bye.